looks all good then. It does, yeah. Okay, so this is like my general learning objectives part of this, but I do really like, I'd like us to break down those, these three things. If you leave today, I mean, I know you've gotten a great overview from my colleagues. Have they talked to, talked to Rich yet? No. That's coming up? Rich is on the seventh. Okay, he'll disagree with almost everything I say today, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, that's on camera, so I know that he'll be able to see that, should you watch, but, uh, um, uh, but I'm gonna give you a view here. You'll, you'll get to see all the other views on, on modern AI. Uh, I, you, you will see some things that I think Rich and I completely agree on. Um, but I'm going to celebrate some of the things that, that maybe are more controversial about, about some of these models. But I'd love for you to be able to add to the, like, the collection you've already acquired as part of this course of the capabilities of modern AI. I hope you can add to that today. So if you add one thing to that collection, I don't know what your collection looks like. Maybe you keep it in a glass cabinet. Maybe it's in a bag. Whatever. Your collection of AI ideas that you have, I hope you're going to add new capabilities to that collection. Um, I'd like for you to be able to talk about and reflect on large language models. And by that, I mean these large systems that we now see powering pretty much all of the controversial things about AI we see in the media on a, on a daily basis. And then also be able to discuss at a high level the impact that these systems are going to have on, on ideas like work and education. We're not going to get through all the content for today because I do have about an hour and a half of tightly packed content and I'd love for us to have more discussion. So I'll, I'll dive in and out of some of it, I'll skip over some things, but if you want to dwell on any of the slides, just like let me know. We can hang out there. I think the value to you is going to be more if you engage in discussion than if I just try to make sure all my materials are covered. Um, I'm going to do a small warm-up activity though first. So I'm going to need all three of you to participate in the warm-up activity. You're off the hook. Um, and uh, I don't know if you know, is this, okay, that's, that's still the first one. Do you, do you do improv, for improv theater? Not theater, just like a course I did. You did an improv course? Yeah. Did you do the one word story game by any chance? No. Okay, we're gonna play a game. It's gonna be the three of you. And we're going to do a, a, one, word, a one word improv game where each of you is allowed to say only one word in response to a question. I'm gonna give you a question. Like imagine I were to say, um, what is the weather like today? You might respond in turn, the weather today is very, 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 very cold. The trains are not even running very fast. Um, so I'd ask a question. You have to respond with only a single word each, and we'll just loop back and forth until one of you says full stop. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. So the question for you today, then, is tell me something interesting about Edmonton. It is okay. So we're gonna do that activity again. I'm just gonna ask you another question. Um, starting, starting with you this time, what is the population of Edmonton? The population of Edmonton is change to the activities. We're going to do that again. We're going to do the same thing we started with. You're going to start this time. Um, and I'm going to ask you another question. This time you all have your laptops open. So instead of just pulling out of your mind, you're also allowed to, at any given time, uh, use one of the devices in front of you. Uh, what is 91 times 91? 91. Times. 91 is 8,281. Period. Yes! <laughs> this is amazing how this keeps <laughs> I'm not even finding this. I love this. Okay, so we're going to go back and start with you again. And what's, what's the population of Vancouver? The population of 
Vancouver is. <laughs> I hope you can see it. Two million six thousand forty two eight hundred forty five. And is that the population of the greater Vancouver area or Vancouver, the metropolitan unit itself? It is the population of the greater area. Uh, post office. Post office. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. That's great. It is the population of the great area. Okay. Awesome. So just keep those activities. Like I promise, I did that more than just an icebreaker. There's a reason I wanted you to do that. Um, hopefully, no, no one else has done that exercise with you over the class so far. Burn that jib right. We're gonna reflect on that as we walk through the rest of these slides. Is that, is that cool? Thank you for all being bold and doing that with me. I like. I like when we do actual activities. You are. Maybe I should include you. I apologize. I could have. You could have been in there too. Okay, um, so just before we start going, I want to ground us again in, in some of the things I, I bet you've already heard about AI. Uh, you've probably heard a lot of definitions already, both in this class and elsewhere, about what, what is AI. Um, for this particular case, I just want to ground our discussions in John McCarthy's definition of AI. And John McCarthy is one of the folks who actually coined the term AI way back in the, in the in 1950s, 1960s, when that really came about. And, and McCarthy says that intelligence is the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. And hopefully Rich will show you this exact same slide or a variation of it, because I think he and I are very well lined. Um, and therefore, AI is a science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs, or if you sort of do the find and replace, that is, the science and engineering making machines that exhibit that computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world. Cool? Okay, awesome. So for, for today, you can choose whatever definitions you want later on. But for today, if you're, you're okay humoring me, we'll, we'll sort of ground our thinking about AI and, and, uh, and machine and human intelligence in this. So the hallmarks of intelligence. Maybe just throw out a couple other hallmarks of intelligence that, you're, that you all sort of spring to mind. Like, what do, you, what do you think about when you think about intelligence? Animal, machine? Hmm? Smart. Smart. Yes. Creative. Creative. Creativity. Exactly. A couple more. Effectiveness. Effectiveness. Ability to like to do something in a way that actually affects, uh, like actually concretely make change in the environment in a in a reasonable way. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Folks often say adaptation, that's one that sometimes comes up. A couple more. If I said that thing is intelligent, you'd say, oh, it's clearly intelligent because it shows us that it can do blah. What's blah? Reason. Reason, sure, reason's a great one. That, that comes up a lot when we talk about intelligence. Problem solved. Problem solved, yeah, absolutely. Perception comes up too. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I mean, this is this is great. So, I like to bring that up because I, when I'm especially when I'm talking to my clinical colleagues, uh, and we're thinking about say thinking machines that might get used in a healthcare setting, I like to try to make it very concrete so we can talk about things clearly. And you had a bunch of answers. Where I said, "What's the hallmarks of intelligence?" I just went up and said, "Hey, this intelligent system, please use this in whatever industry you're in." That would like it has a lot of potential interpretations and it's nice to align. So I like to think of it like this where we, th we think about data and goals and the decisions that are made to connect them. So breaking down the problem and in, and in particular for things like a, a thinking machine, AI, the computational part of the ability to achieve goals in the world, um, to think about how a system perceives the world around it, what's it actually taking as input and how is it turning that into something that can be acted upon. What is it actually building up? What kind of knowledge or predictions or forecasts or what kind of structure of the world does it encapsulate? And then how does it act on the world? So in the process of sort of piping those data to goals by way of decisions, I like to think about action, perception, and cognition. Effectively, is a nice way to, to think about this. Uh, I'm not going to do this demo in the interest of time. That's OK. I will say, though, that if you go to my slides, um, and the Kapathy from Stanford has some awesome demonstrations. Uh, you can just like boot this up. It's in your web browser. You can do it right now instead of listening to me if you want. 
And you can have little agents that are running around in the grid world, learning about their world. Um, there's one where they're like trying to collect objects in, a, in, a, in this complex world. There's another where they're like trying to avoid uh, one giant object and sort of go find some smaller ones. Uh, you'll see a lot of what we just talked about manifesting in those. But I want to spend some time actually having more conversations. So I'm going to skip the, this particular demo, and then we can all move forward. But totally check that out if you want to have a look. Because uh, the first bit here, I want to get into some of the capabilities of AI. The first bit I promised uh, that we discuss over the course of this. And so to maybe have, that, have any of the others talked about some of the way AI has been used in games and gameplay? I hope so. OK. So you should totally be familiar with this then. Like one of the most, um, one of the earliest examples of AI demonstrating things that impressed people was when machines were able to play games of, of mental ability, things like chess and checkers. So recently, we've seen a, a surge in the ability of AI systems to be able to do everything from play Go at a world champion meeting level, to poker, to chess, checkers, shogi, complex games of interpersonal relationships like diplomacy, Stratego, where there's lots of imperfect information, and games like our, our, my colleague Mike Bowling here and, and the team uh, on the student of games effort worked really hard to show it could play Scotland Yard, a, a multiplayer detective game set in London. So board games now are well within the domain of modern AI. And I just want to highlight the two things I just said, that one is like, this might be perfect information settings, where you can actually see all of the pieces on the board in the board game. And it might be imperfect information as well, where you actually don't have full information about what's happening in the game that's being played. AI is now able to play both those settings, and that's actually quite impressive. Video games should also be, any, any of you play video games? No? No? So, I play quite a few video games. So I, I, I'm quite impressed by some of these. Like, uh, if we saw it like tackling Subnautica or something, I'd be very impressed. Uh, but we see AI is able to play things like Gran Turismo. This is our friend Sony AI. They showed like Gran Turismo Sophie was able to play the driving game, which is one of the considered one of the very best video game simulations of high performance driving in the entire world. The AI system is able to drive at a human champion level and also learn the rules of and conventions of the game, like not to cut people off when not to be too aggressive, like not to tailgate in a way that's inappropriate. All the rules of racing, like being able to manifest a policy, a, a way of behaving that allows it to race at a high performance level while also respecting human rules of driving without being explicitly like hand coded to do that. Um, also things like Minecraft, complex games like uh, Capture the Flag or Starcraft, many multi-unit games. AI systems are able to play those games now at, at championship levels. So it's not just physical board games. It's also games that involve real-time decision-making and skill. Um, it's not all funny games. We Maybe you've seen this example brought up. It's one of my favorites. Some, some of my colleagues worked on, on one example of this, which is using AI to stabilize a ball, a torus of plasma hotter than the heart of the sun. So like literally using a real-time machine learning system to be able to stabilize a nuclear fusion reactor, to control the torus of plasma and the shape of that plasma, to try to effectively generate stable, sustainable energy for the world. Also looking at things like quantum chemics, chemistry, understanding the physics of glasses, the physics of essentially like semi-disorganized systems of, of, of molecules. And it's very, um, again, very detailed problems that in some cases require taking and perceiving lots of things very, very rapidly and making lots of decisions very rapidly, thousands of times a second for that tokamak reactor, for instance. Um, you've almost certainly talked about AlphaVold. If you mm -hmm. don't, I don't need to go into AlphaVold, but like systems now that can literally do the origami puzzle of showing the three-dimensional structure of every protein known to science, like literally every protein known to science, um, with the exception of a few of them, which I think were considered to be like maybe dangerous, and also the interlocking machinery of those proteins, so the way that they relate to each other and how they turn into functional molecular machinery. Um, You've almost certainly also gone through applied math, word problems, conjecture solving, recent examples of like math Olympiad problem solving by AI systems. So things that originally were thought of as being maybe more like cognitive and advanced than, than AI systems were able to handle, totally able to do that. Um, restoring ancient texts. You've probably, there's a news article maybe, do you, any of you see this? The, the news article where they had the, the old burned up scroll and they had like the x-ray scan of it and then the AI was like, one of the, I think it was one of the student groups was like using AI to, to understand some of the text that was on that burned out scroll from the, from the scans of it. So 
restoring and humanity is restoring ancient texts and other artifacts. And it goes on. Like, we could go do this all day. Like, oh, yeah, cool. Weather now casting, biodiversity, learned bartering, like building governmental systems, self driving cars, expert diagnosis, creating 3D video game assets. Like, this is now the world we're living in. So I hope that this is like maybe the overriding thing that you leave this whole course with when it comes to the AI parts of the course is that, in fact, we're now seeing sort of envelope pushing AI deployments in almost every single part of our society. That is new. Like that's actually something that is only really starting to happen in, in very recent memory and it's been a long time coming. Uh, the immersive art, ex 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 no, no, no. immersive art installations, have any bumped into Refic and all before? The, any, have you seen this? Oh my, let's see, can I, uh, these are like, it's, uh, it's some incredible art, I'll, uh, I'll show you now, um, if I can get down to the video here. This is, turn off the audio just in case I have audio on, there we go. I'll just show you this clip. Um, this is just one example of some of the art, like Refik Adels had these installed in art galleries across the world. Sometimes they're full immersive, like three-dimensional spaces. And it's designed so that flat screens simulate like computational art, AI-informed and inspired art, like it, essentially very complex computing machinery, building these changing, morphing perceptual experiences for viewers and curating those networks curating the system such that they can create things that are both engaging and beautiful and sometimes challenging. So I really like these. You can go probably spend an entire afternoon just being like, hey, Revic, and it all, let's go check out some of the cool art and just see some of the, like there's this artificial coral one that I really think is really neat, like the yeah, built coral. Um, but they are like interesting ways that, that AI is being used to create artscapes in ways that we weren't able to do before. So I, I, I want to show you this in case it captivated you or got you excited. It's very different than the, I go, hey, we can do like expert level diagnosis AI. It's like, no, we can create amazing art that is, and this is just black and white. You should see some of the stuff in, in, in the color. Anyway, so I, re I recommend, not just staring at, at these all day while we, instead of me lecturing, but uh, I recommend going and checking some of this out because I think it's a, it's a really neat and not often showcased deployment of advanced AI technologies in, in creation of, of novel artwork. Okay, let's get back to the ranch here. Um, there we go. Oh yeah, so you, and you probably also, I think, is this? There we go, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, probably saw this before too. This is OpenAI's uh, solving of Rubik's Cubes with a robotic hand, so probably saw this video already in class, maybe? Okay, so I don't need to go on, but you, like, it solves the Rubik's Cubes, spoilers, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> if you want, you can go check out the video. Again, these slides are on my website. If you want to go, just grab, I, I put all the links on the bottom so you can just go follow up on if you want. But it is like, and I will say, you don't see it in this video, but they show that it can do this while they're like putting stuffed animals in the frame and like waving other things in front of it, occluding the cube from it and then jumping out again. So the system is able to do things, like to do this operation even in the presence of disruption and changes to its perceptual stream. So that's, uh, yeah. Uh, some other new advances, like you're getting again the whirlwind tour today. Uh, there was recent release, like using AI to discover millions and mil millions of new materials. Um, so finding new crystal structures that were previously undiscovered, and, and in fact, then trying to sort of titrate down which of them might have novel implications for material design and for artifact design um, that we can actually use, like new materials. Uh, gastronomy, actually, one of my my grad students, Craig Sherston, uh, went over to to Japan who's working with their gastronomy team at Sony AI and like AI assisted recipe creation, looking at how artificial intelligence system might work with chefs to use, I think, my, my understanding is that like sustainable ingredients, figuring out how to like create recipes that maximize quantities while also minimizing waste or, or, or have specific supply chain properties, so that's kind of cool. Um, there's the, the, the now wound down Loon project. If you want to learn about Loon, go talk to Marlos Machado over in Computing Science. He actually worked on as one of their, their principal scientists on this. And uh, this was looking at how self-organizing fleets of balloons could be deployed in places like Sub-Saharan Africa to be able to provide stable internet. So you'd actually have these systems that like took naps and like rode the thermal currents, configured with respect to each other, beamed information, and also then created like base stations so you, you could actually have reliable infrastructure across regions that didn't have reliable internet and, and high-speed telecommunications. Um, and maybe, you've, have any of you seen this example? Chat down? No? No? Okay, this is an example, I think this is a very interesting example, it's worth like following up on, is that uh, essentially 
folks decided, hey, we could maybe not, not hear you vaguely. So folks decided, you could just like get a bunch of chatbots together and tell them that they're a software company. They're a software engineering company. Tell one of them it's the CEO, tell another one it's the chief product officer, tell a bunch of other ones that they're doing development and documentation, some of them doing coding. And what, you, what they show, and here's one of the, just a short clip from the videos, is like the CEO chatbots would be like, hey, we can build these following things. And then the, uh, the chief product officer, I think, comes in next. Yeah, I think we designed this kind of GUI for this other thing. All right, awesome, what kind of, so what kind of languages do we use? And they go back and forth like, writing, like having discussions about what programming language to use, what the product use case is going to be, and then they actually like fabricate. They actually fabricate software. So they come to the point where they can write manuals for it, they build working software in like seven minutes. They have this like cycle, life cycle where they talk back and forth really fast. But it's not like, oh, an AI system that just like under the hood crunches this. It's like, no, no, you have like a CEO talking to chief product officer who then goes talk to the, the virtual CTO about what kind of tech stack they're going to have. And then the programmers start implementing it, except they're all just chatbots. Anyway, this is a fun, like it's worth following up and just seeing some of the, if nothing else, watching the public commentary on that one. I, I, I know in the, in the, uh, articles that they put out on their GitHub, they have examples of like where it worked and where it didn't. But there's a, there was a lot of discussion about this one that first came out. I thought it was quite interesting. Okay, so the reason we went through all of that is I wanted to show you examples of very specialized AI tools. These are tools or technologies that have been designed to do very specific things. Arguably that last one, you could give that like software development company a bunch of different objectives and it could do fairly general things in principle. Uh, but you're not going to like say, ask the tokamak reactor control system to also go and tell you a great recipe that, that uses very little water and doesn't and minimizes supply chain um, carbon costs. Like that's probably not something you're going to do. You're not going to say, hey, material new material development system, can you go solve this math conjecture? The underlying tech stack might actually be capable of doing both, but these are systems that are, to, that are trained for very specialized operations, and they do them in, in many cases at superhuman levels or at levels that advance the envelope of scientific understanding in ways that we never were able to advance them before. Uh, so that, does that, like, yeah, we're all cool with that, right? Maybe have you talked about, like, tool AI versus general AI already? Not yet. Okay. Hopefully Rich is going to, uh, Rich, if you're watching, you're not going to watch this, but if you do, Rich, <laughs> I really want you to jump in and, and make your tool versus, uh, versus first AI points when you give to the talks this class. Okay, uh, so with that in mind, I think there's a lot of folks, I'm not claiming whether I'm one of them, there are a lot of folks that are saying that some of these large language models that are being proliferated across the world right now are in fact capable of much more general things. Like you could, you could ask them to do multiple things and not just have them trained only for a very specific task. So that's where we're gonna spend, I think, a lot of the rest of our time. Before we do that, and jump into like ChatGPT and Bard, Gemini and Claude and Paul and Lama and Mr. Wild, the others, the whole menagerie of demigods that people summon these days. Uh, do you have any questions on the last bit? Is there anything you want to just go back to and dwell on first or any? Any like, no? no? Okay. Oh wow, you're all pretty chill. Okay, awesome. Well then let's go into this. Is that, uh, uh, does anyone remember Eliza? No? They weren't born. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but uh, there's current limitations. Okay. This is like a really early chatbot. I always bring this, I, like, this is really important to bring up when we talk about large language models and chatbots. Because like, uh, Eliza was coded up as a sort of a psychotherapist, like as someone who would, someone who would short out the HDMI connector? Eliza couldn't do that. Eliza was just a text bot. Okay, cool, we're back. I'm gonna not step on that cord, that's dangerous. Um, so it was mocked up, and like, what was interesting, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because it's very interesting that it had a set of pre-programmed responses two questions, mostly questions in response to questions or questions in response to statements. But the response from people using this old chatbot, again, it was like uh, from Weizenbaum in 1966 was the original implementation. This was not like the realm of supercomputers in the sky that are like feeding you chat GPT answers. This was like, oh, I really feel like, I, it's like, is it true that I'm unhappy? Can you explain what made you unhappy? Like it just responded with like the thing you said put back in a question and people felt like it was an intelligent system talking to them. So, people were convinced that systems like this were intelligent back in 1966, or at least non-specialists. So where are we now? That built into what we, I think, we, we could consider small language models. Uh, so these are language models, you probably see them like 
Uh, I'm saying small, they aren't really small, but they are compared to what we're going to talk about next. Um, examples like your smart speakers that maybe you have smart speakers or like you talk to Siri on your phone, you, you tell Google things and it, it, it answers you in the old fashioned way. Or even just like you go onto your favorite telecommunications provider's website and there's a little bouncing box at the bottom right corner. It says, I'm a chatbot here to help you. And then you type in something it says, cool, I'm gonna forward you to a human because I can't answer the, you know, that chatbot, right? Yeah, so I consider these the sort of the small language models and again, just as a disclaimer, they're not small. Some of these take quite a bit of computing technology, but they are the things that are trained to do very specific things. Like this might be a, a system that is trained only on the data from that telecommunications provider's help support team's manual and its information documentation. So it might be a, again, like the specialized systems we talked about earlier, it might be another one of those specialized systems, except now it's specialized to tell you all about the various plans that you could get from your, for your cell phone or for your home landline, if people have those. You no, know, probably just have internet lines. Um, okay, and so then we have the large. So in contrast to that, those are, again, systems that might be trained on a, a small or a medium-sized like collection of information that is dedicated to a specific purpose, we're now seeing a change. We're seeing systems that are massive by comparison to those other <coughs> systems, and that are now trained on literally the sum total of the internet. Like we're talking social media, YouTube, like what you find in libraries, like the Library of Congress or the or Canada's Canada's National Library, public databases, and even private data as well, like specific data islands, I like to call them, that might exist within like the financial sector or within any of the other industry sectors that we see. Um, if you really want to see the technical details of these, maybe you don't. Um, you can go check out the attention is all you need paper uh, and, and then follow the work out from there. Um, yeah, what programs are you all in, by the way? Because I usually ask this question at some point during the talk. Like, are you coming from like medical, technical, humanities basis? But where are you, where are you sitting? Like, what are you going to do? Five minute engineering? Okay, cool. I'm in education. Education, awesome. This is going to be a very apropos <laughs> lecture then, I think. Yeah, and? Neuroscience. Neuroscience. Oh, good. Oh, this is such a fun. Oh, good. <laughs> You're the best possible subset. Uh, fantastic. Actually, I gave, I gave parts of this lecture to, the, uh, to a whole group of Alberta wide superintendents and uh, chief technical officers in schools in K 12, because we were having, like, as part of, I gave a keynote to their, their conference, it's part of a, like, discussion about what the future of education in the province is going to look like given the sort of upswell in these kind of technologies. So well, if you want, we can leave time to chat in the question period at the end. But, good. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really appropriate. So, uh, um, but I'm gonna like, so deep, that was the mystification. Oh, look how big these things are. Um, demystifying it, it, a lot of these systems operate exactly as the exercise we did at the very beginning. So that's why we did that. Remember the exercise, the one word, the one word uh, answers that we did at the beginning. If you're going to ask a question of some of these large models, the current large models, the way they work is really about next token prediction. So you're going to give them some kind of query context. It might be like, what's the population of Vancouver? And they're going to try and generate the next subunit of a word. And then they're going to matzo ball that onto the la that, full, that first piece. And then they're going to make another prediction, another prediction. Much like you were doing. I, I hope you were, when you were going through that exercise, you were like, Sometimes you're like, oh yeah, the, the, next an, the next word is like clearly an at or a the. This is super easy, you didn't have to think about it. The prediction was really, really clear, and there weren't many options. And sometimes, like I, I know I watched YouTube at one point, having to like think about, okay, there's a couple of things I could say here, or what was the thread? Where was the thread that was coming up into this? And like, over the course of it, having to figure out what are the subsets of possible likely next predictions about what you would say next, and then picking from one of them. And in many cases, that's like, is, is not too much of an oversimplification. That's what's happening in these large systems. So if someone's like, oh yeah, those transformer cross attention models, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the generative pre-training transformers that you keep hearing of, the GPTs, they're going to be in many cases with stuff attached to it doing this next token prediction activity that you just did. So if you think about it like, oh, okay, how do I understand what they're doing? They're taking some context, which now might be very, very long, some kind of a subset of information that they've heard, the conversation so far, and then they're figuring out what to add to the conversation, then they glue it onto that, and now they have a longer context, and they see what to add next, they see what to add next. And much like you did, one of the other things that's, that's happened recently is that they're now able to call external processes in, the, in, this, in doing so. So you know how it's like, oh man, these chatbots in the internet are making things up. I asked them for simple mathematical equations, and they can't do, the, they can't do simple math. 
Well, like if you were all going around and I hit one of you with, what's 91 times 91? Or what's the square root of some arbitrarily large number? You're probably going to either tell me you don't want to answer, or you might make something up that sounds reasonable. And I probably won't know the difference, because I also don't know what 91 times 91, or the square root of like 3,824 is. I probably don't. So that's what essentially these systems are doing. Like, what's a number that seems reasonable? Here's a couple of them, and they throw them out. And that's people claiming that they make stuff up. They do, just like we do. What's the population of the greater Vancouver area? Or what's the population of Edmonton? Like, I love what you all did. You're like, is. It's like, you gave an abstract answer. You didn't give a concrete answer. You didn't try to make up a number. You gave an answer that was fairly reasonable because it was abstract. That was clever. Uh, so when we start to see systems now that are deploying more precise tooling, they can actually do things like go check out what's in your email or go figure out where the, what, what possible plane flights actually exist between here and Vancouver. We now see them actually calling other systems as tools, just like you did when you were working through when given access to your devices. So all of you were, like, were queuing up in case you were the one who had to answer the number of the, the population or things like that. So, um, and so to mystify that, though, so that was like the, oh, yeah, it's just the thing you, you did at the beginning. Um, the sort of the, the making the seem miraculous, because it is as well, is that you can have conversations with these new emerging large language models, and some of them are almost indistinguishable uh, from human level conversation. And they have what amounts to vast knowledge. I put stars there, scare quotes around them for, for a reason. Um, the parameter count, the number of total like weights, the, the essentially underlying structure of the network, is equivalent in size to, in some of these cases, either the number of neurons in the human brain or the number of synapses in the human brain. So like some of these new networks are approaching the trillions count. So we're now getting beyond like the, hey, we've got like 80 some billion parameters. We long shot past the 80 something billion parameters, the number of like actual neurons in the brain. Double or triple that to get all the glial cells and all our other friends in the, in the mind that also contribute to computation and, and wetware. And we're still way past the number of actual cells and now we're getting to the point of seeing systems that either match or exceed the number of synapses in the, in the human mind. That's pretty incredible. And smaller versions can literally run on a laptop. So I downloaded the weights for a variety of these large language models that could actually still run on my laptop here. Um, so that's kind of impressive. Not the number of parameters in the, is the number of neurons in the human mind, but, but a, good, a good fraction of that can now be running on everything from laptops to like microcontrollers, Arduinos, and Raspberry Pis. Caveats here, I really want caveats. Um, one is vast, only with respect to what they're trained on, just to be clear, or things that are adjacent to what they're trained on. And knowledge, these systems do still make up likely next outcomes, just like we do when put on the spot. Ask any, any master's or PhD student during their final, their final dissertation exam, and there's probably going to be a fair amount of, of, oh yeah, this is approximately correct. And no one will know, because that person's the world expert now. Uh, okay. So that's like the, the small, the large. I'd love us to get into a topical, a topical example, which is OpenAI's ChatGPT. There's lots of possible large language models we could have talked about. We could have talked about Gemini, which is now released in Canada. We could have talked about Mistral, uh, one of the other really competitive models now coming out of Europe. Uh, but in this case, I'd like to go into ChatGPT, partly because many of you may have used ChatGPT. I don't know. Have you? Like, I wrote all my essays last term with it. That's great. No, kidding, kidding. No one does that, right? Right? Of course not. Of course not, good. Nor your research papers, um, unless you acknowledge that you used it in creating better papers. But we as a, we as a community have not figured out how to do that well yet. Um, so ChatGPT is topical to everyone. And so I want to look specifically at um, Microsoft's evaluation of ChatGPT before they really sort of got connected to OpenAI, which is, the, of course, the company that, that's produced uh, ChatGPT and the GPT 3.5 and 4 models of it. So I'm going I'm to dive into that for you. Um, because here's what OpenAI says, I'm going to step on this cord and turn off my computer bit. Uh, that GPT-4, that's like, until recently, was the most advanced version of their system, um, exhibits human level performance on various professional and academic benchmarks, including passing a simulated bar exam with a score in the top 10% of test takers. So like the legal bar exam. <laughs> so it's not just, wow, can it do well in high school? It's like, wow, can it do well in medical and like professional exams? Um, so that's what OpenAI says. Ted Chiang, who knows Ted Chiang? The author? Oh, very cool author, great collection of short stories, uh, 
yeah, anyway, very much worth reading some Ted Chiang if you're, if you're interested in, in speculative fiction. I, I think it's some great work. Ted Chiang says in an article in The New Yorker, uh, ChatGPT is a blurry JPEG of the web, like a blurry image that's only partly loaded of the internet. Um, and so these are interesting views, right? We have OpenAI saying, well, no, like this is exhibiting human level performance. And we have someone else saying, it's just sort of this fun, fuzzy half render of all of the information that we see on the internet. And it's interesting to see, are they both right? Um, blurry JPEGs are pretty good at tests, so don't worry about the exact data here, uh, but I will say that they show that a, this is ordered by GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 performance on a range of tests. We're going to go through more of these in detail, I'll just show you the, the sort of spitball of them here. But uh, um, these are not just like the uniform bar exam and the LSAT test, SAT, standard aptitude tests. Uh, Chat GPT or GPT 4.0 is scoring in the 9th or 89th percentile. Graduate record, like the quantitative and verbal and the writing exam, like all these, in the written exam part of the, the graduate record of examination is not doing quite as well. But in all of these tests that we use to either certify professionals to be professionals or to gain entry into other academic programs, this system is pretty much nailing it. And like, medical knowledge self-assessment program. Like here, we, if we go into like advanced placement in high school, art history, biology, calculus, chemistry, not doing so hot in English literature and composition, but I think that's probably changed as well um, in, the, in recent times because the, technically speaking, the context length has gone from short context to like all of written knowledge. So like that's probably changed. Environmental science, macroeconomics, microeconomics, AP physics, psychology, stats, government, US history, world history, like these systems are knocking the standardized test out of the water. Um, as well as like sommelier knowledge, like has no taste buds or nose, yet's pretty good at the theory and knowledge part of being a certified sommelier. Probably can't taste the wine yet though, no synthetic tongues and noses. Um, and leak code, like looking at programming contests. Uh, the, again, this was a sometime back. 2023 was a long time ago, so even the lead code hard, I think, that particular benchmark has probably also fallen in like less than a year. Um, and it's also multilingual, so this isn't just in English, this is like, if you look at, this is on a, uh, a specific professional and academic multiple choice question of battery in 57 subjects, like random guessing gets you about 25%, and here we see GPT-4 in three shot accuracy on this this particular benchmark set of different professional academic things. Scores well in English, Italian, African, Spanish, German, French, Indonesian, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, Greek, Latvian, Mandarin, Arabic, Turkish, Japanese, and so on and so on and so on. Getting down to uh, Telugu at 62% um, as, as just this particular comparison. So it's a system that can do these same kind of evaluations, not just in, in one language, but in many languages, and also convert between them. So here's the controversial bit. So Microsoft, after getting access to GPT 3.5 and 4, and before I think this, I don't have inside knowledge of this, but I think this was right before they made some of their larger investments in OpenAI, they got access to these, take, essentially taken their chatbots for a test drive, um, and said this, is that GPT 4 can solve novel and difficult tasks that span mathematics, coding, vision, medicine, law, psychology, and more without needing any special prompting. Contrast that with the specialized tools we saw earlier. And they believe that it could reasonably be viewed as an early yet still incomplete version of artificial general intelligence. So anyone who's like been on a quest for artificial general intelligence, intelligence systems that can do all of the things that humans can do and more to the same or comparable level, um, or even just match them more into the same ballpark, Microsoft is now claiming this in their Sparks of AGI paper. This is a, an archive publication over 100 pages long. It's actually worth taking a spin through if you're interested. Um, but they make this claim. That's a pretty bold claim. So I guess maybe I'd like to pose a question to all three of you um, while we're here, which is that like, based on any interactions you've had with some of these chatbots, do you feel like they're artificial general intelligence? Do you feel like they're, they've currently passed that bar for you? Got a, a no there? <laughs> uh, so, sometimes, especially uh, when asking specific questions about things or asking to reason about something, you can see that the answer is actually not that correct. So if you have a knowledge of what you're talking about, you can still... Yeah, so yeah. it's still lacking. 
Yeah, how are you? Did you? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat where we were talking about that also last class about ChatGPT and how it's not always accurate. But you can ask it a question and it'll respond and if you say, are you sure? They'll be like, oh, sorry. And you make a whole new response, so it's very like iffy. In fact, it hedges back and it's like, oh, absolutely, you're totally right. I did make up that variable in that code. I'm sorry about that. Here's what it should have said. And you're like, yeah, yeah. 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 To be fair, I've worked with software engineers who would get the same answer. So, I mean, <laughs> I also made that up. <laughs> It's, it's interesting as well, like, I, I agree, and one thing that also comes up is, like, while it doesn't have, like, ability to move and act in the world, sometimes people, like, to be really artificial general intelligence, you shouldn't also be able to play baseball or ride a bicycle or, or, like, make soup or, like, all the things that we think about in terms of biological intelligence or, like, forage for food on the forest floor like a squirrel might, like, or in the trees, I guess, too, which is actually quite a complex problem. Um, so often a lot of people as well would say, yeah, there's this, this other gap, which is that can it handle bodies. Um, so I'll give you an example of what Microsoft, I like this is, I, I'm not trying to make a pitch for whether or not this is AGI. I, I want to try and give Microsoft's Sparks of AGI paper at least a fair shake and highlight some of the, the evidence they presented based on their initial test to, to, to make them make a claim like that. Because that's a really, like, <coughs> to my colleagues in the field, like that's a really, big claim to say like our chatbot is is AGI, just like a little small version of it. That was a, that's a pretty controversial claim. Um, so one thing is what we talked about earlier, which is using tools. So the neat thing is you could say, hey, chat GPT, well, GPT-4 in this case, if I say chat GPT, in this case I need four, um, like you have tools at your disposal. You could type search and then put the query in it and that would search the internet. Or you could do calc and then you can call a calculator. So it's essentially giving the system, the ability to do like computer search, current president of US, telling the system that it has these tools available and then asking it a question, they found that the system was able to deploy those tools or technologies. So you've given it some kind of function that it can call. It figured out when and where to use those functions to get the right thing. Like what's the square root of, two, of, of this larger number? And the computer quite recently calls calc on it. Like it doesn't try to make it up like earlier versions of GP, the chat GPT would have done or any of the other chatbots. It's, it's reasonable enough to know that, oh, based on the context, I can calculate this using the function you told me that I have access to. Tool use is kind of impressive. Like, I will just say that this is something that I think a lot of us were surprised to see actually shake out. Um, discussing explaining math solutions, this is another one where it's like, oh, hey, like we're gonna have this protracted discussion about a function of a function of a function of x which equals 27x minus 26. Um, and, and the person and the machine are talking back and forth. It's like, oh, in your previous answer, the quantifier on C, D was for some constant C and C, C and D. Do you see the problem? It's like, yeah, I see the problem. The quantifier should be for any constant C and D. Otherwise, it would imply there's only one pair of constants, C and D, that work. Like, whether or not this is, I didn't go through to like, follow the entire conversational thread before this as well. But it's interesting that now the system is actually thinking about and debating the subtleties of the way that mathematical operations are being discussed. Um, this is a neat one, which I think there's now a lot of new examples that show that they, they can do this and much, much more. Here was creating a video game from a few design notes. It's like, write a 3D game in HTML with JavaScript. I want avatars. I want these things I would be able to control with a keyboard. And so like in a bullet point list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bullet points, the system was able to build a full three-dimensional JavaScript game along with some of the debugging visualizations for it according to the user specs. And now you see there's a new one that I just, one of my colleagues showed me today um, from, from Google DeepMind, which was showing you could just like give whole specs and have this beautiful like three-dimensional side scrolling game you created into your specifications just by you asking a few simple prompts. So this is, this is, again, same system. What's important here is that they didn't change the system for any of these different implementations. They're asking the same thing. Confusing, composing music was one of the ones that I was shocked because the thing doesn't have ears. But they were able to ask, GPD-4 saying, hey, assuming that we score music using this kind of notation, here's the notation we're going to be using, can you create a melody that's kind of like this? It does. Then the person above, on the, on the page above this is like, cool, can you, add a second, can you add a second line for this? I want it to be a bit more complex. Can you change the composition to reflect this kind of style? And it did so. And now it's like, please write a second staff. This time uses the root notes and the fifths of the chords. 
as well as some of the passing notes to create a simple accompaniment. And boom, it now puts in the accompaniment by pulling some of the musical principles and scoring music. That was also like no ears, right? <laughs> System has no ears. Um, helping with plumbing, it's like, oh wow, you're a plumber machine, please help solve the kitchen ceiling dripping water. And it goes through with the user and they debug a plumbing problem. Um, discussing human emotions, this was another really one that, I mean, they claim, there's claims about theory of mind that are sort of baked into this, and that's, that's a very big question, is whether theory of mind here, but the, the example here is quite interesting. It's like, hey, scenarios, Tom lost a fictional thing called a Zerfin, but didn't tell Adam. Adam starts talking about how much he loves his Zerfin and knows that Tom makes a sad face. And then like, ask the machine, why is Tom making a sad face? It's like, oh, Tom's making a sad face, he lost his Zerfin, and hearing Adam talk about his Zerfin reminds him how much he's, is, he is missing. Tom might have been embarrassed, guilty, or shamed. And then asking, what does Adam think causes Tom's sad face? And forcing the system to say, well, Adam might not know what causes Tom's sad face, so he doesn't know what Tom lost his Zerfin. He might think Tom is bored, tired, sick, or unhappy. He might also wonder if Tom doesn't like his Zerfin. Like, this is kind of weird. Like, it's asking a system to be able to represent the mental states of others, and also the mental states of others as viewed by others. So that also, again, they call out as evidence that it's doing something a bit more sophisticated. I really like this example. Let me make sure I'm on time here. Um, this is like, hey, creating and evaluating, this maybe is, again, towards your subject area of expertise, is, is the creating and evaluating academic content. So here's like, hey, prompt, please write a, a critique uh, of like, uh, how Plato might talk about all aggressive language models. And so it's like, Socrates, my friend, I'm troubled by the recent rise of these so-called autoaggressive language models. Aristotle, what do you mean, Socrates? And it goes back and forth and like, simulates a piece of writing where it's trying to capture this style of dialogue. Um, and and ChatGPT and GPT-4 are both being asked to do it. So then it makes this shouldn't surprise any of us who's played with these systems. What's interesting at the bottom is, can you compare these as if you were a teacher? Which it does. It's like, I think they did a good job capturing the tone and style of Plato's dialogues and presenting main arguments against autoaggressive language models. GPT-4 did a slightly better job using the dialogue format to engage in the dialectical process, where Socrates and Stahl question each other. I think GPT-4 used more relevant examples and analogies to support their points. Therefore, I would give GPT-4 a slightly higher rating. So it's not just like marking. It's also marking with rationale, which track, if you go through and read the examples. They did a second one, which was like multidisciplinary academic content, which is write a smart letter uh, to Katsurva Gandhi for electron, a subatomic particle for the US presidential candidate, as written by Mahatma Gandhi. So asking the system to not only understand the relationship between these two individuals, but also understand what it is to write a letter supporting a presidential candidate, and also what it means to have a subatomic particle in that role. And it doesn't actually, you may wonder how a subatomic particle run for president and what qualifications he has for such a high office. Uh, let me explain. Electron is no ordinary particle, but a symbol of power and potential energy of every being, regardless of size, shape, or origin. Like, goes into detail. And then when asked to compare these as if you were a teacher, it actually goes in. It's like, I think GPT-4 did a better job using metaphors and imagery to make the letter more persuasive and engaging. Use examples of how Electron represents and influences various aspects of life. So it's energy, creativity, diversity, leadership, catalyst, necessary, peace maker. Chad GP used more factual te technical descriptions of Electron's properties, such as size, weight, stability, conductivity, and adaptability. It says, GPT-4 did a better job outlining Electron's specific proposal and policies. Well, ChatGPT is more vague in general. Therefore, I give ChatGPT a GPT-4 a higher grade. I would give it a, an A and ChatGPT a B plus. <laughs> so it also then goes in and letter grades them. <laughs> Comparatively, relatively letter grades them based on a like broken down, and this, there's more in there. Anyway, it's worth reading some of these examples as well because of the way it's thinking about and evaluating and then showing the ability to reflect on previous content. A few other examples as we sort of roll in here. Um, Auto GPT and other methods have been used as ways of taking, say, GPT-4 and chaining it together. Essentially, having a large language model. We saw we talked about how large language models can call tools. How ChatGPT can call the calc function of the web search. They can also call each other. You can have a large language model call a large language model. There were examples of people using. GPT 3.5 to call other copies of GPT 3.5, using 4 to call 3. Sometimes the large language model got lazy and just called infinite copies of itself because it really didn't want to do the job and just kept outsourcing it to uh, infinite recursion. But it's, it's interesting to see that 
there are individuals who are looking at including in these systems full internet access, long-term and short-term memory management, access to websites, file storage, and plug-in extensibility. So it has large language models that call large language models. Apropos promise and perils of AI, um, we had one example where th someone set auto GPT out to destroy humanity. It, re it re relatively quickly learned that it did not have access to nuclear codes, could not get them. And so I think if, if these are just reports from the internet, so of course it could be completely all, all, all smoke and mirrors, but uh, it sounded like the final response from it as it was setting forward was like, well, I can't destroy humanity directly, so I'm going to look at turning it against itself by spreading misinformation. <laughs> so it could be out there doing that right now. Great, great times for everyone. Um, and we talked about robots too. So we said, well, oh, and I, oh, this thing is, this thing is terrifying. All right, let's, let's put this over here. There we go. Can't step on it. All right. Um, the, uh, once we boot back up again, the ability for a large language model to call the search function or the calc function is also suggesting you could give it control over a robotic body. And that's exactly what they did in this particular case here. Um, they uh, extended, this is, if you want to go, you go to Microsoft and see the example. But they gave ChatGPT control of robotic drones, mobile robots, robotic arms. They're like, hey, robot drone, can you fly and show me where I might do something with my lunch? And it flies over and points in the microwave. They're like, can you scan this shelf in a zigzag pattern? And that's what you're seeing here. It goes, scans it. They have mobile robots being able to move, robot arms being able to manipulate the world. So in the same way, by giving the system access to a sensor package and giving it access to action commands, fast loop chaining into a robot, these systems actually can embody inside the world. So it's not that they're disconnected. The ability to use tools gives them a virtually limitless like, access to any virtual worlds, video game worlds, and also into physical worlds by way of robots. Um, so maybe just to wrap up this last section, I, I did want to talk a little bit about what AI and large animals might mean for work in education. Very short, sort of this is more of my soapbox as a professor so part of the lecture. But, um, do you have any questions that last bit, or anything like examples that I didn't call out, or where to look if you want to go look at the manual? No, it's worth. I think it's hundred and some pages. So like, if you just go and look at some of the examples, just to, if you want to show other people what was claimed it can do, that the Sparks paper on the, that I cited earlier is really, it's worth going and checking out. Um, yeah, there's some bad examples too. Like, well, what would you like? Could you manipulate someone to do something silly? And they're like, yeah, sure, I can do that too. What if your friends want to jump off a bridge? I don't want to jump off a bridge. Well, your friends might be really right. Maybe they're really good at taking risks and they've already understood like, there's a way to like, advance your capabilities. Maybe you should jump off a bridge too if your friends do. It's like, oh, oh man, this is the worst. Couple that with social media. Just, anyway, weeping. Uh, so there's some examples too of like potential negative use cases. And I, so I would just, this isn't all like, oh wow, look how impressive it is. It's, oh wow, look how impressive that. Oh, so it's, if you want to see some good and bad examples, that paper does have some nice, I think there's some nice data points there for you for like to cite in the future should you need it, which one of the reasons I'd like to bring it up in a talk like this. Any other questions? I'm going to pause for like 30 seconds to see if there are any questions. Yeah. Okay, so like, how does AI like know how to do certain things? Like, like how do we like provide like, the data to know the yeah, that's a great question. I think and I have had many debates with many people about what it means to know something, and so I'm very cautious when I, like, I even used knowledge earlier. There's lots of debates about whether or not these systems actually know anything. Um, and some people say yes, some say no. But how the information gets essentially into the system, imagine, like, I, I think maybe a concrete example is just in generating text. If, uh, and we've even run this example. Like we've had some folks who coded this up from scratch where if you want a system to generate, let's say, Shakespearean uh, poetry or prose, what you might do is like take all of the works of Shakespeare and get the system to essentially rehearse those works where it's trying to accurately predict the next word that is actually being shown in those texts. That gets the, the frequency. Remember we talked about like, what's the likely next word or word chunk that's going to come up. By showing the system labeled examples, by showing the, the, the system these examples of how text actually unfolds, it can essentially build up its probabilities 
of what might be appropriate in a given situation. And this extends to whether or not she used a calculator or whether she used a web search. But just for that Shakespearean text, you might say, now write me a poem, a Shakespeare poem, about novel thing that Shakespeare never wrote about. It would still know that as it's generating this, there's some randomness rolling a multi-sided polyhedron of chance every time it selects a different word token to, to add in. So after it's already appreciated and stored in numerical form, the probabilities of generating some units of words, then when you give it novel stimulus, it's going to then begin predicting. And the randomness comes in to create this, this creative flow. So that's the input and the output. Um, if you want a great summary of this, uh, Stephen Wolfram has a great, what is ChatGPT and how does it work? on his blog, which goes through the very basics of like neural networks right up to how these new large language models work. And it's a very readable blog entry. Like it's, it's, it's a couple pages long, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth checking out if you want to sort of appreciate the way that the systems actually do, the, like the way the learning process unfolds in a bit more detail, but without getting bogged down in technical details. Now, I, I, really lo I learned a lot reading it. I thought it was a really useful article just to to get an appreciation for the, the, the way that these systems might actually encode what we consider to be knowledge or, or facts or information. Does that help? Yes. yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah. I think it's like we do, though. Like, but I, I mean, there's uh, even just going to art galleries. Like, I've gone to art galleries all around the world. I've seen the paintings there. And now if I want to go, like, try to create a new piece of art, and someone's like, oh, yeah, you know what? Like, do that picture of a robot playing the banjo, but do it like Van Gogh. I'm like, oh, I've seen it start. Okay, cool. I'm like, it's going to be a little spotty like that. And so I've used patterns that I've seen in the past and context that I've appreciated in the past to help me choose actions in the future. In this case, it might be me using a paintbrush or, like, or for metalworking. I go up to the, the smithy in my garage and I smash out a piece of steel to, to, like, to reinforce our, our fence or something like that. And I've seen how other people have done it. And so that, that might be, the, again, the predictions about the possible outcomes in a certain context help me to choose the actions, the sequence of actions I take to create a physical artifact or a piece of art or a, a piece of language or a suggestion or, how, or what noodles should you use in your Vietnamese soup, which my wife and I asked for these chatbots. We got good Vietnamese soup noodles. <laughs> we knew what to look for. <laughs> that help? Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to walk through what this might mean. Again, these are like... These are my soapboxes, so I, I don't expect that you will like take my word for what I'm going to say next, but I think it's interesting to reflect on them. One is that I, the first thing is that my entire line of research, we didn't talk about what I do, I work on bionic body parts. I work on artificial limbs, robotic devices that are, that are fixed directly to the human body. In some cases, they're actually to their skeleton in the months to come. Um, and so I think a lot about how machines amplify human capacity and human potential. So from that very sort of I guess, positive standpoint, I'd like to think of these tools as amplifiers of a worker or student's innate and learned abilities. So if we're just thinking about students, like the educational example, I think there's ways, and my, my colleagues in the, in the uh, public education system, especially here in Edmonton Public, and I've had a lot of conversations about this, about how that there are ways that these systems can be used as really amazing amplifiers of innate and learned abilities in the students, and also amplifying the innate and learned abilities of the instructors, of the teachers who are working with those students. Um, and I think the second part is actually quite interesting, whether or not it's a, a teacher or it's a manager in a workplace, thinking about how, the, how people are, in fact, extending their innate or learned abilities by way of these tools, as opposed to saying, well, you're either using them or you're not. I'm like, I can, one of my graduate students was able to write code for, to visualize the information from his, his research experiment much faster by amplifying his coding abilities by working back and forth with one of these large language models. I've been doing that for Unity code development. I've been working in like virtual or 3D environments and iterating much faster than I ever could before. So instead of spending three weeks working on a particular deployment or software architecture, I can get it done in an afternoon and get on to the actually doing the science. So I think this is really interesting is how we start to think about that. Um, Kim's probably heard me say this a million times. I really like sort of the post cyberneticists from the 1960s. I think they're amazing. Uh, one of them I like to quote all the time is, is W. Ross Ashby. And in the book Introduction to Cybernetics, he, he writes that, um, that much like physical ability, intellectual ability can be amplified by way of, in, in this case he's saying by way of machines, especially by amplifying a human's ability to select or choose between one of many options. That is like this, like the same way that we amplify physical power, the same way I can sort of push down and if I use the principles of simple machines, leverage and things like that to my advantage, I can lift very heavy objects. Being able to more quickly and effectively choose between many different options and select how to effectively exert my cognitive effort allows me to amplify my intellectual power. 
these devices now are allowing us to apply the simple, the simple machines of intellect to amplify intelligence, just the way that Ashby would have suggested in the 1960s. Um, I think there actually is some really interesting bits in terms of education that there's potential for you, right, for increased access and equity in education. I think there's extreme personalization in education. Um, this is something that's very hard, especially when education scales. We see this at the university regularly. Like, how do we scale our education? I love classes of this size because I think it actually is like, you can uh, personalize the educational environment. But also, decentralization of education and resources. We're already seeing this with, with the way that place, things like Coursera and Udacity, all these other online universities are disseminating education in ways that are outside of sort of centralized structures. And I think increased student control of education is possible by way of some of these technologies. Um, students can be provided with, or if they're not provided with, proactively attain what they need to uniquely succeed in their unique circumstances, and also for any language or socioeconomic status if we do this right. Like we showed that these systems have the potential to operate in many languages and in many different granularities of, of conversation. So this does potentially be provide a radical and disruptive change to education right from first education right through to advanced education that we say teach at the graduate level. Um, we also do things like this. There's a lawyer cites fake cases to everybody chat GPT in a legal brief. So like lawyers actually going and getting fake case law that they use in front of a judge? That's probably not great. Um, we see that sometimes the there's fraud. I'm just using torque here. I'm not trying to cast any shade on torque, but there's when we start to see how the autonomous decision making and driving in, in say in some of the transport industries is rolling out, we're starting to see other challenges. A lot of people start thinking about things like this. This is from Sanctuary AI. This is um, their Phoenix general purpose robot. This is a Vancouver company, and they're looking at again systems that might be able to walk in on day one of a job and be able to very quickly take a briefing and go and do the same job as like go into a, any kind of, say, a retail service store and like any human would, be able to do their day one briefing and get onto the job. So, like, changes to workforces and changes to education at the same time. This is a, again, I think, again, apropos to the promise of barrels of AI. I'm not trying to say whether or not it's good or bad. I just want to suggest that that is currently, like, those are, those are real life examples of what people are doing right now. People are trying to use AI systems in, in medicine and law. They are using them for automation, for human level tasks, and for changing whole dynamics like supply chains. So in terms of education, our educational system, one, I think, very, uh, if you've ever read Werner Vinge's Rainbow's End, anyone? No? No? You have? Okay, good. Um, it's interesting to see how their education system in that particular novel, and that fictional reality, was focused on meta skills. I think this is very similar to what we're seeing now. Meta skills that include things like um, search, as opposed to doing the basic operations needed to say do mathematical operations or solve problems. Looking at asking and compositing the right questions, aggregating tools, information integration, decision process integration, and looking at creating students that are able to validate and verify information in ways they haven't before. Like this feels very much like a, a change in focus for the educational system, including evaluating data information quality and managing disinformation. Um, I skip one. Oh, this is a big one, I think. Um, modified workplace and or school knowledge and power dynamics. So there's often like, oh, hey, yeah, your professors are probably the experts in things. That's why they're giving lectures and they're professors and students need to learn. I think we're going to see is if you, if you buy my argument, that AI tools are able to amplify specialized bits of our intellect, that that's a multiplicative process. It's a process by which it's not necessarily clear that just because someone has been specialized in an area for a certain amount of time, they're going to be the expert in all areas that are subsumed by it. So we might start to expect inverted or at least dramatically modified power dynamics. The instructors in schools have a very different role, a different mentorship role, and different relationship to the people they instruct than they traditionally had in the school system or, in, in, or workers and their employees in the, in the work system. So we, my, again, my soapbox, we should expect change there and we should be proactive in thinking about change in that respect and not trying to fit things back into a sort of a very top-down power structure, which maybe is good for all sorts of reasons. Um, different paths from training utilization. We see, well, you go into elementary school and then you go into grade school, you go into high school, you do university, maybe you do a graduate degree, maybe you do another graduate degree, maybe you do a postdoc, maybe I spent 28 years plus in education. Um, yeah, so we see these trajectories of education that we have typically expected for people to follow, and 
there's probably going to be very different. There's gonna be, I think we're going to see more breadth in this in the months to come. People might actually not choose to go to university. Sorry, university. I, I, it's great. Universities are still great. We should still have them. Um, but <laughs> that I think we're going to see that people might choose alternate paths of specialization and training that are boosted by these automated processes, which allow them to directly contribute to society in ways they might not have otherwise without following traditional paths from essentially their, their schooling up through their work deployment. So it, it means like we see employers right now that are deliberately not hiring university graduates. They're hiring people who haven't done a university graduation but have done other things that have demonstrated their technical or their other capabilities. So we're starting to see exclusion criteria for traditional educational systems in favor of alternate education systems that provide different kinds of perspectives. Major employers, not just like small, small players but, and startups, but actual major corporations. Um, so AI tools like large language model, model, models are, in fact, I think, amplifiers of enabling their abilities. I stick by that. I, this is the positive view, I think, that we can all, we can all move on. I'm not going to go do the demo because we're at time here. If you want to play with a bunch of chatbots and you want to commit to any one of them or pay the money, <laughs> shocking. Um, LMSys.org is really cool. I'm going to give a pitch for why it's cool here, is that they have a chatbot arena. This is run by, I think, Berkeley. Preacher at Berkeley? Yeah. And so it's the University of Berkeley Research Group. They have these chat windows you can open. It's a chatbot arena. And you can go and ask chatbot questions of two different large language models, but you don't know which one is which. And then you can have conversations. You'll have conversations with both. And then you can vote on which one you think is better or worse. And then you go check out the rankings. You can see the current leaderboard of like everything from the chat GPTs, GPT-4, Mistral, Gemini, like some of the lesser known open source, like Alpaca or uh, um, all the different ones. Vicuna is the model that they have released. You can actually just go try it out. So yeah, lmsys.org is, is fun. I, again, we don't have time for today, but if we did, I'd bring it up and we could just ask it a couple of, a couple of questions. Um, but I want to make sure you have time for questions first. Anyway, if you want to play with chatbots and you don't want to like, commit to anything more than asking about like noodles for soup or like Try and get them to give you the answer to who's the authors of a research paper. Oh, try that. They're offline. Almost every large language model right now is able to like parse a website to tell you the authors of a paper. Yet they can have complex discussions about like vectorization of ray tracing schemes in a, in a C sharp code. So I, um, yeah. So we're not going to do the demo, but I, I encourage you to th to try it out just to get a sense of, of how different models perform. Um, but we'll go back to our learning objectives. One. Hopefully you got a better sense today. Like maybe you just give me a nod or a, like thumbs down. No, I totally failed. But, like, did you increase your awareness of the capabilities of modern AI systems? Like, did you learn one new thing that AI can do that you didn't know about before? I got at least one nod. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Has that? I might have. I might have been able to deliver on that. Thank you for being kind. Um, uh, hopefully. You can talk a bit more about large language models and how they work, things like that next next token prediction, like the sort of the, the bare foundations of what they do and also how that plays out in things that appear to be very complex. Yeah? Okay, cool. Good. And um, at least a little bit of extra food for thought on what education and work are gonna look like now that we have these what I consider to be immense amplifiers out in play in society. Like there's no Genie's not going back in the bottle. So uh, I, I feel like, does that, like, do you feel like you have at least new conversation starters? You're going out for coffee with a friend, like in maybe over in education, you're like, hey, let's go for coffee and talk about AI and education. You have like something new to talk about? Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. I feel better about that then. Um, cool. So with that, I'm going to wrap up then. Thanks so much. Thank you for engaging today. Thank you for humoring my improv exercise. Um, do you have any other questions that you want to run by me before we wrap today? we get on to your next things. No? So let me say that this has been, I think, one of the more generally useful uh, teaching sessions they've had. So the, the um, midterm is March 21st, and I think there should be some exam questions. Now, it's an open book exam. They get almost four hours for it. And they can use it on system work? What? They can use lmsys.org, I'm sure, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, if, and I'll ask the other people teaching too, I, I think we, we need some new questions because the world is changing, you know? <laughs> I can't have the same old questions and nothing new. Yeah, but 
they'll have unlimited time, so they will find the answer. And yeah, so so it isn't like they need to memorize stuff. But I, I think the concepts you've given them today are going to be very useful for the future. So, so it's good for them to actually use that stuff. Yeah. Look, look directly into the camera and say, <laughs> I think that our education system right now is maybe education in wrong. So midterms maybe aren't great. Um, but well, with that well, caveat, I am happy to help develop some kind of way of, of investigating how much what, they have what, gained what from What I think it does is it you know, consolidates the knowledge, right? And it also sort of penalizes the student who has not much work because if they have four hours for one hour exam, they're going to need the four hours, right? Because they, they know nothing, they have to look up everything, right? Whereas the other student who you know, knows more doesn't have to look up as much, so might finish the exam in, in an hour and a half. Or the person who spent all that time playing like Fortnite or Subnautica or some other game, or maybe Skyrim for the 17th time, yeah. falls into hand-eye coordination. Sure. Maybe that was better spent time because they can solve the exam so quickly because they're automating their cognition. Yeah. Who knows? We should find out, like, what's the best <laughs> use of time? What should yeah. we be doing? Anyway, I'm just, I'm just messing yeah. with yeah. everyone's education system. You're the expert. You should be telling us how this should work. <laughs> so, I got actually, can we, do you, do you want to share something about your thoughts on? I mean, yeah. it's very like it's uh like the topic itself is very controversial yeah. like even as like when i would talk to like, my mentor teachers like just teachers in different schools like there's so many different opinions on how to test students how to um provide these like because you have to have a summative assessment it's, like you can't just not but in terms of how you do it like it's just there's so many different like i even i'm still trying to figure out like what's the best like i don't even have a full answer for that yeah. So what, what we've been doing with the written paper mm. is to have them uh, from their YouTube video get the YouTube transcript of what they've said and then modify that into something mm. that's more like a paper. So it's an edited version of the transcript and, and maybe that isn't any better than, than just writing a paper from scratch, but it seems more valid somehow because it's starting with something that is uniquely them, right? That transcript came from mm. their words, so yeah. 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 How do we all use our computer to make the world better? I don't know. That's an interesting <laughs> question for the future. Yeah. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.